In today's scripture reading, we continue the story of John the Baptist's birth and Zechariah's faith and trust in God in the naming of his son. I am reading various verses from Luke chapter 1. When the time came for Elizabeth to have her child, she gave birth to a boy. Her neighbors and relatives celebrated with her because they had heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy. On the eighth day, it came time to circumcise the child. They wanted to name him Zechariah because that was his father's name. But his mother replied, no, his name will be John. They said to her, none of your relatives have that name. Then they began gesturing to his father to see what he wanted to call him. After asking for a tablet, he surprised everyone by saying, his name is John. At that moment, Zechariah was able to speak again, and he began praising God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Prepare the way for the Lord. Let every heart prepare him room. For 2,000 years, Christians have turned to the story and message of John the Baptist in the weeks leading up to Christmas in order to ready their hearts to celebrate Jesus' birth through the powerful message of John the Baptist. Well, today we're continuing in our Advent sermon series called Preparing the Way for Christmas as we continue to look at the life of John the Baptist. Now, you might remember from last week that John's mother was Elizabeth, and she was a relative of Mary's, most likely Mary's aunt. And so, therefore, John is a cousin to Jesus, born about six months before Jesus. And John's purpose in life was to prepare the way for the Messiah, to help people prepare their hearts for the message that Jesus would bring. And so during the Advent season, we not only remember and celebrate the first coming of Christ, but we also prepare our hearts to receive Christ again. So let's continue in that preparation today as we continue in our story of John the Baptist. Now, last week, we were introduced to Zechariah and Elizabeth. They were an older couple. Zechariah was a priest in the temple. They had prayed their entire life for children, and they were never able to have a child. Last week, Pastor Bethany told us that Zechariah was a priest who served in the temple, and there was a -a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for these priests, and that was to go into the inner chamber, the Holy of Holies, and offer an incense sacrificed to God. And this was Zechariah's day. So he went into that holy space where there should have been no one else, but there was a man standing there. Zechariah quickly realized this was no man. This was an angel. We're not told what special qualities he had, but there was something about him that had to be glorious. And the angel said to Zechariah, what most angels say when they show up in the Bible for the first time, do you know what that is? Don't be afraid. Fear not. I don't know why, but I'm guessing there's something kind of scary about angels when they show up. I think I'd probably be afraid. That'd be my first instinct. But Gabriel goes on to explain to Zechariah that he has great news for him, that his and Elizabeth's prayers have been answered, and Elizabeth was to bear a son, and they were to call him John, and he was coming to prepare the way for the Messiah. And at that moment, the words that Zacharias spoke were, how can I be sure? I mean, you have the angel of God standing in front of you, and he says, how can I be sure? This angel came in a glorious way with the best news ever. And he said, how can I be sure? Well, Gabriel says, "Uh, because I'm Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God. I was to speak, I was sent to speak to you and to bring the good news to you. Well, know this, 
What I have spoken will come true at the proper time, but because you didn't believe, you will remain silent, unable to speak until the day when these things happen. I, can think, I think we can see why Zechariah might have had some doubts. I want this to be true. I just am having a hard time believing it's true. So as I think about that part of the story, I think about the role that doubt plays in our lives. I mean, here was this older priest. He was, we are told that he loved God, that he was blameless and righteous in every way, and yet he doubted God. I think about that, and I think about our desire to always want a sure thing in life. But he said to the angel, I just don't know how this is going to happen. How can I be sure of this? I mean, how can we be sure of anything, really, right? There are very, very few sure things in life. In 1989, Jerry and I were living in his hometown of Ann Arbor, Michigan. Jerry was teaching high school band. I was working at the First United Methodist Church of Ann Arbor doing children's choirs. Our son Mark was three years old, and I was expecting our second child in February. And late that summer, Jerry got a phone call from the director of bands at the University of Michigan and offered him his dream job. He asked Jerry if he'd like to be the interim director of the Michigan Marching Band for a year while they did a national search. While Jerry had been in the band four years as a student, he served two more years as a graduate assistant with the band. He knew this band, and he knew the University of Michigan inside out, so he jumped at the chance. And it was a great year. It was a successful year. But come February, when they announced who they were going to hire for the full-time job, it wasn't Jerry. So we brushed ourselves off and picked us up by our bootstraps, and Jerry started looking for a job with other college marching bands. And he was really successful in his applications. In fact, in just a few months, he had three interviews, and he got three job offers. And so as we considered these job offers, we discussed them with one another, we prayed about it, we called our family and our friends and asked for their advice, and one by one, we turned these jobs down. We just felt like they weren't the right career path for Jerry or the right place, the next place for our family. We had faith that something better would come, and we waited, and we waited, and we wondered if we were making the right decisions. In the end, we knew we were just going to have to trust our gut. Well, finally, in June, Jerry had an interview with the University of Texas Longhorn Marching Band. And in August, we moved our little family, now family of four, to Austin, Texas. And it worked out great for us. But you know, sometimes, even when you do your homework, when you pray, when you gather all the information you can, things still don't work out. And when that happens, you make a course correction and you continue on. I want you to think about similar situations in your life. Maybe it's your career path, or maybe it's a relationship, or your marriage. Maybe it's that decision about what college you're going to attend next year. I'm guessing there's some of you who invest in the stock market. When you invest, are you sure you're going to make money? If anybody tells you they have a sure thing, you better run the other way, right? Because <laughs> there are no sure things there. And every decision that we make, we do our homework, we gather information, we talk about it with trusted family and friends, pray about it, and then we say, okay, I have all this information, here's my decision. And you trust, and you make a leap of faith. I think we're all going to have questions about many things in life, including our faith, I really love this quote from Frederick Buechner. It says, doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. They keep it awake and moving. Doubt is not the opposite of faith. It's not the enemy of faith. Doubt is our brain asking questions about things that we can't see or feel or touch. Doubt doesn't mean you're a bad person. You don't disappoint God when you ask questions. It's just a part of being human. But it's what we do with our doubts that matter. I think about that man who came to Jesus and asked, are you willing to heal my son? Jesus says, of course I'm willing. 
all things are possible for those who believe. To which she said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. How can you be sure? You can't. At some point, you need to make a decision based on all the facts that you've gathered, and then you trust. In fact, coming up in January, that's going to be our sermon series as we wrestle with doubt together. We're going to ask questions like, does God really exist? How do I know the Bible's true? Is there a heaven? You know, I think when we wrestle with doubts and questions, that can be a pathway to a deeper faith. So I invite you to join me in January as we wrestle with doubt together. Okay, but back to our story for today. So Gabriel tells Zechariah that because he didn't trust and because he wanted certainty, he would not be able to speak for the next nine months. Can you imagine? He's been given the best news of his life, this news he has waited for his entire life, and he can't share it with anybody. I think this was God's way of saying, Zechariah, you talk too much. I need you to listen more. I'm wondering if you're like me and you've ever said something that you wished almost instantly that you could take back. Or have you been in those conversations where you find yourself, you're not really listening to what the other person's saying, but you're formulating your response at the same time? You know, I think that's why God gave us two ears and one mouth, to listen more and speak less. James puts it a little bit more eloquently. He says we should be quick to listen and slow to speak. I think God gave Zechariah nine months of silence so he'd be forced to actually listen and pay attention to what was going on around him. And we see the same theme throughout Scripture. Psalm 46 says, Be still and know that I am God. And then in Habakkuk we read, The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. You know, right after Thanksgiving this year, I took some days and I went to a retreat center for my own personal silent retreat. When I got there, I realized I was the only person at the whole retreat center. So I not only had my private chef, but I had a lot of space and a lot of silence. And I spent time taking long walks in the woods, talking to God, listening to God. I read scripture. I did some sermon planning. This sermon, as a matter of fact, the irony of a silent retreat and talking about silence was not lost. I had to write a paper for a class that I was in about my goals for my leadership over the next few years of ministry. And as I settled into the silence and got quiet, I found clarity. So I wonder, actually I pray, that you might find a little more silence in this season talk less, listen more, spend time with God. You know that hymn that we just sang a few minutes ago, Let All Mortal Flesh Keep Silence? Do you know that is the oldest hymn in our hymnal? It was written in 275. That's an old hymn, originally composed. It's not the same arrangement that we have in our hymnal today. But we hear these words that talk about the the incarnation and the coming of the babe to us in Bethlehem. And then we hear this response that we are called to. Let all mortal flesh keep silence and with fear and trembling stand. Ponder nothing earthly minded. For with blessing in his hand, Christ our God to earth descendeth our full homage to demand. When the time came for Elizabeth to have her child, she gave birth to a boy. Her neighbors and her relatives celebrated with her because they heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy. On the eighth day, it came time to circumcise the child, and they wanted to name him Zechariah because that was his father's name. But his mother replied, no, his name will be John. And they said to her, none of your relatives have that name. And then they began gesturing to his father to see what he wanted to call him. 
We'll pause for just a second. I find it interesting that they felt like they needed to gesture to Zechariah. He wasn't deaf. <laughs> he just couldn't speak. Well, after asking for a tablet, he surprised everyone by writing, his name is John. And at that moment, Zechariah was able to speak again. And he began praising God. At that moment, once he fulfilled what the angel Gabriel had told him to do, he was able to speak. And what did he do? He praised God. You know, in the first century, it was quite an honor and a privilege for the fathers to name their children. But I find it interesting that the angel Gabriel gave names to both John and Jesus. He told Zechariah to name his son Johanan or John, which means God is gracious. And then he told Mary to name her child Yeshua or Jesus, which means God saves because her child was going to be the savior of all people. I think we can see now why John's name was God is gracious. He was sent by God because of God's grace to prepare the way for the Lord and to invite people to repent, to return to God because God is gracious and God is merciful. You know the word gracious in Greek means kindness or favor, undeserved blessings that are extended to, one, to someone else simply because of the goodness of the giver, not because the other person deserves it. It's what you embody when you help a stranger. It is especially evident when you help someone who has hurt you in the past. Our God is a gracious God, and we are called to do the same. Grace is the unmerited love of God. I learned that when I was in confirmation in ninth grade. The unmerited love, the undeserved, the unearned love of God, given solely, solely because of God's goodness. You know, that word is used over 150 times in the New Testament, over and over and over again. It's a defining characteristic of God. God is gracious. And John came to show that through his life and through his ministry. It was all about grace. You know, the fact that we live on this planet, this specific planet in this huge cosmos that has water and light and oxygen, this perfect little inhabitable space, that's a gift. The fact that you're alive, that you can breathe, that there's air to breathe, that there's sun to warm our planet, it's not because God looked at human beings and said, they are so great, I'm going to give them the greatest gift ever. In fact, it's quite the opposite because of God's greatness that we are given this gift solely because God loves us. I think some folks think that God operates kind of like Santa Claus. Like if you do good, you're going to receive good. Or if you're naughty, you're going to receive bad things. But scripture tells us that God causes it to rain upon the good and the evil at the same time. That's the nature of God good and merciful. I think this is so important for us to remember when we find ourselves feeling like we need to earn God's favor. If I just work harder, God's going to love me more. If I just pray harder or help more people, God's going to love me all, love me even more. When all along God's been saying, "Child, I have loved you from the beginning." Don't you know that by now? You see this in Jesus as he died on the cross. We see this in John, why he came to prepare the way, calling people to repent because God is gracious and merciful and no matter what you've done in your past or how messed up and complicated your life feels right now, God loves you. The Apostle Paul put it this way in Ephesians He said, you are saved by God's grace because of your faith. This salvation is God's gift. It's not something you possessed. It's not something you did that you can be proud of. Instead, we are God's accomplishments. 
Some translations say God's handiwork. I like that one too. Created in Christ Jesus to do good things. God planned these good things to be the way that we live our lives. You know, I think sometimes we get those verses mixed up and we put verse 9 before verse 8 and we think that God will love me more the more good deeds that I do. That's not how it goes. Instead, it is by God's grace alone that you are saved. And in response to that grace, we are called to live a life that is gracious towards other people, especially people that we sometimes feel don't deserve it. That's just meant to be our way of life. Well, I want to end today with some words from the Reverend Tony Loudon. Reverend Loudon is the personal pastor to Jimmy and Rosalind Carter. And this is part of his benediction that he offered at Mrs. Carter's funeral just a couple of weeks ago. Take a look. You've heard everything about this great soul. You heard that she was from Plains, Georgia. You heard the fact that she loved and she had compassion even for a butterfly. You heard the fact how she loved her grandchildren and oh, how she loved J.C. Jimmy Carter. But I also have to tell you that she loved J.C. Jesus Christ. And I believe the reason why she did so much of the things she did because she read in Spanish and English that faith without works is dead being alone. So when she, were, she read the word of God, it went to her head. And then it got in her heart. And somewhere in the kingdom of God, Ambassador Young, she decided to put her hands to the things of God. From her head to her heart to her hands. Mr. President, she made it a habit. From her head to her heart to her hands, and she made it a habit. If you love our first lady who is global, make it a habit. Take your passion and make it a habit. Link your passion up with compassion, and then there will be peace, and then there will be love, and then we'll have a house United, not divided. What will they say about you at your funeral? What will your children or your friends or your pastors say? Will they say that you took enough time to be silent and listen? Will they say that your life was defined by kindness and mercy towards other people? Did your head and your heart and your hands connect? Did you make it a habit to share the gracious love of God with others? Because I think if you do, people will celebrate who you became as you sought to live a life of a person of grace. Let's pray. Oh God, how grateful we are for this wonderful story and what it teaches us still today. Help us in our doubts. Help us to dig deeper in order to find a deeper faith. Help us to be silent more, to listen more, to hear your voice in the silence. We pray, O Lord, that our head and our hearts and our hands might connect so that our lives might be defined by your grace. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.